for those people who have not uh, been following it since 1965, uh, you might wonder why such a small and in some ways insignificant map has caused uh, such controversy. There are many, many reasons for that. Um, and I will be just pursuing one of those and giving you a little bit of uh, background so that if you're interested, you're able to follow that uh, with your own reading. Um, you're, of course, also welcome to come to the library and look at the Vinland map. It is on exhibit uh, until January 8th uh, of this year, I'm sorry, of next year, I guess. Um, and along with the, the Vinland map are things you'll hear about today. Uh, one of them is the Forma Leone uh, facsimile which is available uh, for you to consult, um, as well as some of the uh, XRF and other scientific imaging uh, that will be discussed in the second part of today's workshop. What I wanted to talk about briefly is the concept of forgeries and that forgeries answer contemporary, not historical questions and needs. Um, and so what needs did the Vinland map fulfill in 1965? Um, and obviously it fulfilled uh, many, and we're just gonna be looking at one strand of those uh, at the moment. I want you to actually see the Vinland map. Some people are uh, haven't seen it. This is a uh, an enhanced photo of it on your left, and the reason it's enhanced is the ink is very very faded uh, and it's very difficult to see. It is in two parts, and those two parts have been uh, taped together. Uh, but that again is part of the uh, the, his the recent history of the map. The ink is 15th century, which we'll talk about in the second half. Sorry, <laughs> the parchment is 15th century, which we'll talk about in the second half. Uh, but the ink is probably sometime between 1923 and 1957. In addition to the map, one of the important things to know about it is that Yale published a book uh, along when it announced the acquisition of the map. Um, and book and map were announced together uh, the day before Columbus Day in 1965. In 1996, for reasons that um, we're still researching, uh, the Yale University Press reissued uh, this book along with some additional materials, which clouded uh, the debate on the authenticity of the map. Um, one of the things to realize that might be difficult for those um, outside of the university is that the press and the university, um, while working uh, in the same building and working together in many ways, are separate entities. And so, um, what the press does and what the university do um, are sometimes parallel and sometimes not. They have their own uh, their own individual workings. The other thing for all of you that are interested in the Vinland map, um, one of the most excellent historical works written uh, on it, and I think an amazing work, uh, is Kirsten Seaver's works, uh, Maps, Myths, and Men, the story of the Vinland map. Um, she looks at the uh, provenance of the map, she looks at the various people that were involved. Um, she tries to get at some of their motivations. Um, and she also suggests uh, a possible uh, map maker. Um, one of the things I think that we'll find by the end of today's presentation is that her um, conception of the map maker is probably uh, misplaced at this point. And so we might start to look elsewhere, which is one of the science, exciting things about the science involved is that both the science and the history have to work together. And this is one of those cases where uh, it doesn't. So the promotion of the map. Um, every crisis is a opportunity. Um, and here, uh, one of the things I wanted to look at were what were the problems uh, with the map? Um, why were all these problems that Kirsten Seaver and others have brought up? Um, why were these overlooked uh, in order to promote the map um, in the time and place that it was presented? And we can't answer you know, all of the reasons uh, for some of these, but the thing I wanted to point out today is that the controversy uh, that its reception uh, caused indicates deep conflicts between immigrant groups in the United States uh, in the 1960s. Um, and these are gonna play out in debates over whether Leif Erikson or Christopher Columbus was the first European uh, to step foot, foot, foot on North America, um, whether Italian Americans were white or non-white, um, and whether the culture of American uh, was descended from Anglo-Saxon or uh, Italian uh, roots. So the day uh, that Yale published um, this new book and announced the Finland map, uh, there, was a, there was a huge international uh, media storm that Yale University Press had actually orchestrated. Um, and so this is, this is the tenor of it. Uh, you can see in this cartoon with um, Yale in Native American uh, uh, 
address, uh, holding a copy of the Vinland map for Columbus uh, as he arrived. Um, there were a lot of sort of cartoons like this that spooked uh, the arrival, um, but it really was a, a national event. Um, and this again gives you a sense of the way they wrote about the reception of the map. And that was very much uh, as a replacement. Um, Leif Erikson here replaces uh, Columbus, um, the first documentary proof that Columbus did not discover America. Um, and this is a, a, from uh, the Chicago Tribune. Um, and it shows you not only, uh, again, this idea of replacing Leif Erikson, but they printed a, a copy of the map um, with little diagrams so that you could follow along and, and understand the significance of it. Oops. But what was really interesting to me, and one of the things that gets lost as um, yes, we get further away in time from the announcement of the map is the immediate intense backlash um, to the release of the Vinland map and this book, um, particularly amongst the Italian American uh, community. Uh, following the controversy, the head of the press claimed that the date of publication, which was the day before Columbus Day, was not chosen to offend, but because the materials are ready to publish. Nonetheless, the effect of that was the Italian Americans were furious. Um, they uh, immediately had representatives indicating that the history was wrong, um, and uh, they uh, had events. This is um, uh, John Lacourt. And here he is uh, ripping up a facsimile of the Vinland map. Uh, and this was published in the Irish Times um, to give you a sense of the, the worldwide backlash to that. There was also local uh, backlash uh, here on Yale's campus. Um, so to the right, you have the Society for the Protection of Christopher Columbus, which I imagine was hastily formed and probably equally hastily disbanded. But it, it's a nice uh, picture with Vikings in the background uh, and the Beinecke Library. And then on the left, one of my favorites uh, with uh, Connecticut's own Joseph Lieberman. Uh, those of you outside of Connecticut might remember that Joseph Lieberman ran with Al Gore uh, in 1980 for vice president of the United States, but he was a long-term senator from uh, Connecticut and uh, attended Yale's law school. Um, and it says there that they're carrying a Floyd copy, which I assume means photocopied copy in this case, uh, which they later burned. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense uh, of this map and its importance. Uh, it does in some way represent uh, Yale as its owner. Um, it represents the donor who was Paul Mellon um, and it represents the publisher and the promoter, uh, Yale University Press, um, each of whom had different motivations uh, in promoting uh, the map itself. So this idea of the, the Vikings uh, coming to America is something that is, is, is even older than the Vinland map, obviously. Um, there were, uh, there's a rune stone in uh, Minnesota uh, that was found in 1898 uh, that was also a fraud, uh, but was also meant to indicate uh, that um, the Vikings uh, had arrived in America centuries and centuries ago. So I just wanted to give you a brief uh, sense of some of the controversy around the map and why I think uh, the map has generated so much interest um, over time. So our first speaker today will be John Paul Floyd. Uh, John Paul Floyd is a graduate of Strathclyde University in Glasgow, Scotland, where he obtained an honors degree in metallurgy in 1991. He has been known to buy and sell the occasional rare book and enjoys investigating historical mysteries, but is a confessed amateur in the fields of cartography and manuscript studies. In 2021, he made some revealing findings about the Vinland map, which are set out in detail in his 2018 book, Asari Saga. Recap before we can get on to the 2011 materials. So let's go back to 1957, which is when the map made its first recorded appearance. Uh, when two book dealers, J.I. Davis and Enzo Ferraioli, brought the map to the British Museum for examination and assessment. It was bound together at that time, actually in a modern binding, with a, a real genuine 15th century manuscript known as the Tartar Relation, um, which consists of a single 16 leaf paper and parchment choir. And just to elaborate a little on the composition, that basically means that you have a sheet of parchment, six sheets of paper, and then another sheet of parchment on top. So the, the paper is basically sandwiched within two sheets of parchment, and then it's folded over in half to make 16 leaves out of the eight sheets. 
Now, interestingly, many phrases in the Vinland map do echo the text of the Tartar relation. So there's obviously some connection, but the wormholes in the map parchment did not align with those in the Tartar relations. So the question would be, did somebody just get random sheets of parchment, copy the map, um, or create the map and then bind it to the Tartar relation. That's the obvious concern with the wormholes at that stage. And here we see the volume that was brought to the British Museum in 1957. Here we see the front cover, um, which makes no pretense to be all this is, this is a modern binding. Um, the map itself, which folds over like this, and it fits onto the first leaf of the Tartar relation. And this is the inscription that um, appears on the, the back of the map, but it's also the, the recto, the front side of the first leaf. So it's the first thing that you would have seen if you were opening the volume in 1957. This would be the first um, the first inscription on an otherwise blank piece of parchment. And here's a close-up of the inscription itself, uh, which we'll be coming back to, don't worry, um, in due course. And the map itself, um, obviously full of details that merit attention. I mean, you could easily spend an entire presentation just going over the, the inscriptions and the various features, some quite anomalous of the map. Um, just to show, here we have Iceland, here we have Greenland, here we have Finland. Uh, over here we have something called the Great Sea of the Tartars, which doesn't appear anywhere else in medieval cartography, but there it is. Um, three islands which rather suggest possibly Japan. Um, over here we have Europe, British Isles, Asia and Africa with a rather strange uh, horizontal cutoff along the bottom there. So who were these two characters who brought the Finland map and Tartar relation volume to the British Museum in 1957? Well, Joseph Irving Davis was a highly respected antiquarian bookseller in London. Um, they'd been in the, the trade for, for decades, having founded it in 1911 with uh, an Italian colleague. He'd been a classical scholar at Cambridge. He actually spoke Latin and another four languages, which is quite an accomplishment. Um, he was a lover of food and company, but there was always an air of detachment um, or even mystery about him. One of his friends, long-time friends, call him uh, an English Machiavelli. And what about Enzo Ferraioli? Well, he was Italian. He was cultured, intelligent. He had a fine classical background, certainly no problems with Latin. In his younger days, he served in the Italian army under Mussolini. He volunteered for Franco during the Spanish Civil War, and then he married and settled down in Spain, added into a wealthy and well-connected Spanish family. He did travel quite a bit throughout Western Europe, uh, buying and selling books on behalf of private clients. He wasn't so much of a, a customer-facing bookseller in the sense that Irving Davis was. Um, it was more behind the scenes, runner on behalf of various dealers. He did have an extensive knowledge of antiquarian books and manuscripts, though, and important contacts. Although, again, um, he was considered quite an eccentric character, and it does seem that both of the individuals involved in the 1957 unearthing of the Vinland map um, are something of an enigma. Now, the British Museum experts felt unable to give their seal of approval uh, to the map. So after that, Ferrioli travelled to Switzerland and he offered the volume um, to an antiquarian bookseller named Nicholas Rauch, with whom he had had dealings before. Now, Rauch was preparing to hold the second in a series of auctions on the theme Travels, Discoveries, Americana. And it's very interesting that Ferrioli um, did not approach Rauch in the first instance because what more appropriate piece of Americana could there possibly be than the Vinland map. You might almost think that the, the map 
was prepared uh, with a view to going into this auction. But in the event, Rauch declined the volume. It didn't go into one of his auctions, but he did bring it to the attention of Lawrence C. Whitten II, who was young American bookseller visiting Europe um, to make acquisitions. And sure enough, Whitten did buy several items from Ferraioli, including the Vinland map Tartar Relation volume. So Lawrence Whitten returned to the United States in September 1957, and he showed the uh, volume containing the Vinland map and Tartar Relation to Thomas E. Marston, who was curator of medieval and Renaissance literature at Yale University Library. Um, another person interested was Alexander Vitar, curator of maps at Yale. Um, both he and Marston were intrigued, but the wormhole issue uh, and also the inscription on the back of the map, which didn't seem to make much sense, um, gave them enough concern to back off from actually purchasing the map at that time. Uh, so Witten decided to put the volume aside for the time being. And then just a few months later, the miracle occurred. Uh, Marston was sent an advanced copy by Irving Davis of book catalogue number 159. One of the books for sale in that catalogue was a manuscript, a four book fragment of a 32 book medieval history by Vincent de Beauvais, the Speculum Historiale, comprising 15 16 leaf paper and parchment quires. The arrangement of the quires was he had a sheet of parchment, six sheets of paper, another sheet of parchment at top, he fold it in half, the paper inside is protected by the parchment on both sides. That's quite unusual. And if it sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly the same arrangement as with the Tartar Relation single choir. The interesting thing is that when Davis wrote his description of the Speculum Historiale in catalogue number 159, he claimed never before to have encountered that arrangement of paper and parchment. We know that isn't true because obviously Davis had taken the Tartar Relation to the British Museum it's almost impossible to believe that he would have forgotten it. So the only conclusion really that you can draw is that he was drawing this to Marston's attention um, in the hope that Marston would pick up on it because Marston would have seen the Tartar relation, he would have been shown it by Witten. So it's very hard to believe that Irving Davis didn't know what was going on here. Uh, interestingly, Marston, speaking at the Vinland conference in 1966, said that his relationship with Irving Davis had not been good. And I think possibly if we understood a bit more about the background to that statement, we would understand more about the history of the Vinland map. But who knows? And here we have the Speculum Storiale in its 15th century binding. This is what Marston purchased from catalogue number 159. So the Speculum Storiale arrives from London. Marston invites Witten to his office at Yale um, to check it out. Witten is struck by similarities between the Speculum manuscript and his own Tartar relation. Um, so Marston agrees to Witten's request to take the Speculum home for further study. And later that night, Marston gets a phone call from a very excited Lawrence Witten. So what had Witten discovered? He'd found that the Speculum manuscript and the Tartar Relation manuscript shared the same dimensions, the same watermark, the same paper and parchment choir composition, but crucially, the wormholes at the start and the end of the Speculum lined up respectively with those in the Vinland map on the one hand and the Tartar Relation on the other. It proved that the Vinland map and the Tartar Relation had been separated in a single volume by the speculum, which went between them in the middle. And that explained why the wormholes in the Vinland map didn't line up with the Tartar relation, because they were separated. And they were separated by this volume that Marston had just bought from Irving Davis. Now, in the light of the discovery, Marston felt that the speculum ought to be reunited with the Vinland map and the Tartar relation 
documents which um, Witten had in the meantime gifted to his wife. So Marston gave Mrs. Witten the speculum manuscript as a gift in the hope that the generous gesture would persuade the Wittens to consider selling the Biddle map to Yale in due course. And indeed, 19, in 1959, um, the offer was made. Uh, Yale contacted one of its alumni, Paul Mellon, uh, for financial assistance, and Mellon agreed to buy the map from Witten and to donate it to Yale if experts were able to authenticate the map. So Alexander Vitor at Yale invited two British museum experts, Skelton and Painter, to undertake a study of the documents in association with Marston. Uh, incidentally, Skelton and Painter had both seen the map in 1957 at the time of the Davis Ferry Lay visit. Mill's aversion to personal publicity meant that the scholars had to work under conditions of strict secrecy, and it was a very lengthy study. But in 1964, Mellon was informed that the experts considered the Midland map authentic, and he donated the documents to Yale as promised. And then, on October the 11th, 1965, the veil of secrecy was lifted, and Yale University published the Vinland map and the Tartar relation to a storm of controversy. And this is one graphic showing the different paths to Yale taken by the Vinland map and Tartar relation volume on the one hand, and the Speculum Historiale volume on the other. Well, so far it's been more or less familiar background, but I now get a chance to move on to the more recent material. The first discovery that I made in 2011 was of two pre-1957 references to the Villar map documents. For decades, one of the great mysteries surrounding the Villar map documents was where they were prior to 1957. Because after all, the Tartar relation and the Spectrum Historiale are recognised as authentic medieval manuscripts, so clearly they must have been somewhere, um, even if the Vinland map itself is a 1950s production. Now, Lawrence Witten had ruled out Saragossa Cathedral Library at the 1966 Vinland map conference, calling it a blind alley. The reason that Saragossa Cathedral Library came into the equation was that Enzo Ferraioli had been convicted of stealing books and manuscripts from that location, selling them on, uh, and it's, it's known for a fact that he sold them on through um, Irving Davis in London, um, and other sellers acquired them, Lawrence Whitten was one, and eventually they were sold on to major institutions like the British Museum Library, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and I regret to say your university, um, which is quite a few of the, um, the stolen manuscripts and books, but it's, it's past history. But basically, that was why Lawrence Whitten was anxious to rule out Saragossa Cathedral Library, because it would imply that the Vinland map might be authentic, but that he didn't have a um, good title to it. So various hypotheses have been um, touted down the years as to where these the Finland map documents might have been housed over the decades. Um, there's been suggestions to the Library of Columbus. Uh, very weirdly, the Library of President Peron of Argentina, uh, without any <laughs> apparent evidence whatsoever for that. Um, a more Recent suggestion has been a library at Miklov Castle that's tied in with uh, Kirsten Seaver's theory of Father Fisher as the forger. I go into all of these um, hypotheses in my book and I explain why really they are they are quite weak. But the, the basically the the correct answer is that the Villa map documents were all housed at Saragossa Cathedral Library. And it's proven by the 1893 catalogue um, that I discovered online. Now, the 1893 catalogue was a real surprise. Uh, 
It turns out that the Yale copy of the Speckman and Story Alley manuscript and the Yale copy of the Tartar Relation were both on display in 1893 as part of a single codex in Madrid at an exposition celebrating Christopher Columbus' discovery of America. And when you consider how closely these documents were associated in 1965 with the controversy um, about Christopher Columbus being dethroned and the, the um, Italian-American reaction to the, the notion that Christopher Columbus was uh, written out of history. The fact that they were um, on display in this context without anybody in the 1960s up to 2011 suspecting this for a moment is quite incredible, really. And this is a photograph of the actual exhibition hall in which the Speckleman Story Alley and the Tartar Relation were on display in Madrid in 1893. The front page here of the catalogue, which contains the description of the manuscripts. And this is the text of the description. This is my translation of the catalogue entry into English. Um, a few things to note here, books 21 to 24 specifically of the speculum. That's obviously a, a Tartar relation manuscript. Um, and the 251 leaves ties in as well with the, the Yale documents. Now, I did mention that I had discovered two uh, pre-1957 references. One was the catalogue. The other um, is to be found among papers left behind uh, by Cristobal Pérez Pastor, who was a Spanish priest and scholar. Um, his unpublished unedited notes um, were left behind and basically published rather indiscriminately um, in a series of four volumes. Uh, and one of the volumes published in 1926 contains another description of the Speculum Historiale Tartar Relation Codex. It does appear to be based upon the 1893 catalogue entry, which wouldn't be too surprising because um, Pérez Pastor uh, was active at the, um, the 1893 exposition. Uh, he is known to have recorded certain um, observations on documents that were at the exposition. So it uh, wouldn't be a surprise if he relied to some extent on the 1893 catalogue. But as we shall see, there's a very, very important addition that he makes. And this is the description of the Codex left behind by Perith Pastor and published in 1926. The important thing to note here is the reference to the second and the third part of the speculum, and we'll see very shortly why that's important. And this is my translation. Again, note here, second and third part. And also, um, notice uh, the, the reference here to Friar Bogeek's Dao. Now that is a misreading of the, the manuscript. Uh, let's have a look here. This is the Yale copy of the Tartar Relation. These letters here are actually IR, so the, the name form in Latin, B O G I R. D-A-O. Um, and what Perith Pastor has done is that he has looked at this and he has mistaken that for an X. And if you look at it, it's quite easy to see how he could have mistaken it for an X. And even the slightest um, spacing difference would have ruined that um, misconception of his and he would have realized that it wasn't an x it was an r now the fact that this is written in such a way as to explain um Perth pastor's misreading ix instead of ir um really that that, that just adds the um 
the seal to the uh, conviction that this really is the actual document that Perth Pastor saw uh, in front of his eyes back in the 1890s or 1900s. Now, this is an extract from a Sunday Times article that was written in 2013 um, about my discoveries. Um, I just want to read this paragraph. Paris Pastor, who died in 1908, describes the parchment leaf that today has Vinland depicted in the reverse, yet he made no mention of the map. He also describes some phrases written on it, which, Floyd argues, that's me, appear to have been tampered with subsequently by a forger. Now, we've just been looking at Perez Pastor's description of the Codex, and you may well ask, how can it possibly be concluded from that that the actual parchment leaves that now contain the villain map were in front of his eyes at the close of the 19th century? Well, it's an inference, but it's a very strong inference, as I think we'll now be able to see. The point is that Perez Pastor mentions that books 21 to 24 of the Speculum Histor Historiale are present and that they constitute the second and third part of the Speculum. Now, since the Speculum consists of 32 books, if Perez Pastor's words are taken at face value, you have a first part comprising 20 books, followed by four books which together make up the second and third parts. It makes no sense at all. It's, it's simply, it's an impossibility. So what I asked myself when I saw that was, Penneth Pastor must have read something that caused him to write the words second and third part at the head of his description. What could it have been? Could it have been the inscription on the back of the Finland map? At first sight, you'd have to say no, um, because he doesn't mention a delineation, uh, which presumably refers to the map on the other side of the leaf. It doesn't mention the first part, it only mentions the second, third parts of the speculum. Um, so that got me thinking, what if this whole bit at the start, in front of the, the reference to the second part, um, is an addition, uh, a forgery, basically? and Sure enough, if we take away this entire first section, we find that we are left with a perfectly rational um, description of the contents of the Yale manuscript, because it says the second part of the third part of the speculum. And if we look at how the books were divided, uh, typically, you would have 32 books in four parts uh, of eight books each. So the third part would be book, books 17 to 24, um, and books 21 to 24 would represent, in that case, the second part of the third part. So it would make sense if this whole reference to the, the delineation um, and this, this, the, the, the rest of it, there's reference to the first part, which doesn't really make any sense in the inscription as it stands. If that's a later edition, then it's quite possible that Perez Pastor would have seen this and that that would account for him mentioning the second part, the third part as well, even though he would have slightly misunderstood it because it's not the second part and the third part, it's the second part of the third part. Now this is the inscription as seen from behind. Uh, basically we're looking at the, the, the left hand leaf of the map here, so Iceland, Greenland, Finland, and this is showing through from the other side. Now you can see this is the entire inscription and you can see very clearly that not all of it is showing through um, with the same intensity. And as soon as I saw that, I thought to myself, well, I can see what you've done here, Mr. Forger. 
Now, this slide is from a presentation that I gave in Denmark in November 2013, um, and this is purely from looking at Perith Pastor's description, looking at the inscription and realising that it makes sense if you get rid of the first half, and then comparing it with, um, actually it's from the Yale uh, University book, which shows on the map itself, shows how the the inscription has only half come through, if you like. Um, so that's, I concluded on the basis of, of that, that half of the inscription was a forgery. And this is a scribal note that appears at the end of uh, book 24, uh, the last book of the Yale um, manuscript. It's not part of the, the text of the speculum itself. It's also a scribal note saying here ends the third part of the speculum. Uh, there's been a lot of ingenuity exercised by researchers as to how uh, books 21 to 24, how you could possibly split them up in such a way that they would constitute in themselves the third part of the 32 book speculum. And the answer is we can now see they don't constitute the third part. They constitute the concluding four books of the third part. In other words, the second part of the third part, as stated by the original note at the head of the manuscript, um, which was seen by Cristobal Perez Pastor. So what conclusions can we draw from Perez Pastor's description of the codex? Firstly, as it originally stood, the inscription at the front mentioned only the speculum. That's all it was intended to, to refer to. There's no reference to any map. There's no reference to delineation. Secondly, Perez Pastor described the same documents that are now at Yale. So he saw the inscription in its original form, and that means that the very parchment leaf which now has Finland depicted on the reverse, was present in the codex when he examined it. Yet he made no mention of the presence of a map in his description. And finally, we can conclude the inscription was purposely altered at some point prior to mid-1957 to make it appear as though it did refer to a map, and that's pretty damning. And now we come on to the second discovery that I made in 2011. Um, it's completely unrelated to the first one. It's basically a visual proof of forgery, which is utterly simple, utterly straightforward, and was missed by everyone over five decades. It's the Formaleone connection. It's been known from the start that the maker of the Vinland map made use of the 1436 world map of Andrea Bianco. In 1782, Vincenzo Formaglioni published a hand engraved copy of the 1436 world map. Of course, the Vinland map has features, which the Bianco map does not. This is the passage that led me to make the Formaleone connection. Skelton here is talking about a chain of about a dozen small islands in the Bianco world map. And he notes that the Vinland map represents these islands by just seven islands. Now, when I read that, I was really puzzled because I was looking at what I thought was an accurate copy of the Bianco world map, and it only showed seven islands, just like the Vinland map. And then it occurred to me that possibly the version of the Bianco map that I was using was inaccurate, um, because Skelton was looking at the original in Venice. Um, I was looking at a copy. Could it be that the copy that I was looking at had also been used by the Vinland map forger and that the forger had fallen into the trap of thinking he was copying Bianco when in fact he was copying an inaccurate copy? This is what Skelton was referring to when he mentioned 
a chain of about a dozen small islands. The um, numerical captions on the left are mine. Uh, both of these maps, charts, are by Andrea Bianco. Now we have Bianco's original on the left and Formaglione's 1782 copy on the right. And you can see by looking at the arrowed uh, islands that they have disappeared, they are omitted in Formaglione's copy. Now we're looking at the Formaglione copy on the left and the Vinland map on the right. And the islands omitted by Formaglione are also omitted by the Vinland map. Now, I propose to fall silent for the next few minutes and just let you see the slides because, in all honesty, I think they speak for themselves. And just to conclude, we've had 50 plus years of controversy and there's been a lot of overlooking the obvious. Quite why? I'm not sure. One thing I'm certain about is that if Skelton had become aware of the uh, Formaglione connection in 1965, I think even on the literal eve of publication, the yield would never have gone ahead. The whole project would have been quietly shelved. It's just embarrassingly obvious now that we're looking at a uh, copy, a forgery, not a medieval artefact. Has the last word been said? Well, as regards the provenance and authenticity, yes, I think those issues have been resolved. I don't think there's any going back now to the position that the, the map might be genuine. But we still don't know who drew it. And I think until that question is definitively answered, the story isn't over. John Paul, thank you uh, very much for that presentation. Um, because I know what comes up next, I won't ruin it for those of you that are watching it, but it's going to fit in, fit in very well with what uh, the scientists at Yale have uh, discovered using entirely different means. 
um, but your your ingenuity uh, in, in looking, uh, particularly the formalione uh, of, uh, of that facsimile, I thought was really brilliant. Um, we're going to hold questions until the end, particularly so that uh, people can can address them um, and have the science and sort of the history uh, side by side. So could I, I, could I briefly sorry could I, could I briefly oh. apologise for the sound quality? Um, it didn't sound like that to me when I was recording it or listening to it, but. It, um, I should maybe have added subtitles or something, but um, I hope you can could have followed. I, I, I was able to hear you very well. I apologize on your behalf if others <laughs> uh, weren't. Um, so uh, it's one of the unfortunate Zoom allows us yeah. to do these amazing things. So you're in Scotland and I'm in New Haven and we're able to do this <laughs> wonderful uh, thing together, but obviously it has its limitations as well. Um, I hope that everybody else was able to uh, hear that. Uh, it, it was really fantastic. At least I was able to, what I got from it was, was really impressive. Yes. Um, so thank you, John Paul. If you would hold on thank until the much. end, so that we can ask uh, ask you questions um, as well. Uh, but as as we're about to see, uh, your thesis is going to fit like a glove uh, with um, some of the materials that uh, the that has come up with. So the, our next presenter is Paula Zayats. Uh, she has been working at conservation in Yale libraries for 17 years. First as assistant chief cur conservator, and now as head of rare books and manuscripts conservation. Previous to Yale, she spent time as rare books conservator at the Conservation Center in Philadelphia, as well as in fellowships and internships at the American Philosophical Society, the Library of Congress, Princeton's Firestone Library, Columbia University, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. At Yale, she specializes in the treatment of parchment manuscripts and has had the privilege of working on original Chaucer manuscripts, Portland charts, the Voynich manuscript, and of course, the Vinland map. Paula? During this two-part presentation, we'll be discussing the new analyses performed at Yale University, not only on the Vinland map, but also on the manuscripts with which it is associated. It has been an ongoing story. We'd like to acknowledge the hard work that has been done on this project so far, with many thanks to our colleagues near and far, especially Team Titanium at Yale. The Vinland map, has been hailed as the earliest depiction of America's coast, supposedly drawn over 50 years earlier than Columbus's famous voyage. Using the analytical methods available to scientists over the last seven decades, there have been numerous attempts to discover its age and authenticity. It's interesting that the Vinland map is rarely mentioned in context with the objects most closely related to it, the text it was once a part of. These three items have an intertwined history, but have never been systematically examined together. Conservators at the Yale University Library have been able to work with scientists from Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, using new methods to examine them and find new information. By amazing coincidence, these two seemingly unrelated volumes arrived in New Haven, Connecticut at exactly the same time. Both reside at Yale's Beinecke Library, along with the map. Vincent de Beauvais, 15th century, Speculum Historiale, and a separately bound, single folio, Historia Tartarorum of the Britia, known as the Tartar Relation. The Vinland map was found at the front of the Tartar Relation when the two volumes arrived at Yale. And the map itself, showing Vinlanda Insula, The puzzling inscription that will be addressed in part two, and the wormholes. And Fonce de Beauvais, Speculum Historiale. The Beinecke Library's copy of the Speculum Historiale is the second volume of a popular medieval encyclopedia in four volumes. This copy is thought to have been written during the Council of Basel, which took place between 1431 and 1449. The Speculum was a common volume in medieval libraries. In Yale's copy, the Gothic script is similar to other examples of the time period, such as in this 15th century alchemical manuscript in Yale's collection, Mellon Manuscript 12, shown on the left, and the Beauvais on the right.
it would be common to find repairs made to the binding or text of a book like the Speculum Historiale, which was likely a frequently used volume. This copy of the Speculum was rebacked in cheap leather. There are new repairs and end sheets and indications of newer sewing and end bands as well. You can clearly see the offset writing on the board, which was left behind when earlier paste downs were removed. Those paste downs have been made from a document dating to 1437, which is still readable in reverse. Using reflectance transformation imaging on the first opening, for the very first time, it was clearly shown that the hardware on the boards and the deep indentations visible in the paper of the first page do not coincide. At some point, the boards of the speculum were switched and the backboard became the front board. Shown here is the backboard. It's clear there's no hardware that could have made the marks we see on the paper of the first leaf. This can only mean that the boards are not original to the text. It's probable that these replacement boards were chosen specifically for the date that can be read in the offset writing. Not only the binding was altered, but the text as well. This close-up shows the pinkish remains of an ownership stamp, which was cut from the foot of a page. The bottom portion of the page was cut away and replaced with new material. The bottom edges of three leaves within the text have been replaced this way, most likely in order to hide other owner's marks. This um, simple stack of paper choirs or sections will help us visualize the choir diagram of the manuscript. The diagram shows the folios of all three manuscripts. There are 15 choirs in the speculum on the right, and each choir is made from an outer folio of parchment, six paper folios, and an inner folio of parchment. Doctors Sarah Fittiment and Matthew Teasdale at Cambridge perform peptide mass fingerprinting using eraser crumb samples taken from each of these parchment folios to determine the species of animal used to make them. It was hoped that the information may help indicate the geographical location where the manuscript was made, but it turns out the speculum contains both calf and goat, and both types of animals were available in most parts of Europe during the Middle Ages. The red lines indicate goat parchment, the blue calf. The DNA of the samples was also analyzed. From the results at present, Dr. Teasdale has said that DNA evidence indicates the two halves of the Vinland map are likely from a single animal, as both the mitochondrial DNA genome and the sex of the animal seem to be the same. He goes on to caveat the results. Their analysis was hampered by significant levels of DNA damage in both samples, meaning that the mitochondrial DNA data from the Vinland map is only 88 percent complete at present. The comparable levels of damage between the samples is in itself encouraging as proof of similarity, but some information is missing in the comparison of the halves. Dr. Fittiman and Teasdale also analyzed the surface microbiome of the map and the two manuscripts. The results of analysis show that the striking similarities between the Vinland map samples on the left suggests that the parchments share a similar history. The microbiome of the various other leaves on the right are relatively similar to one another, with the exception of the first page of the Tartar relation shown in the center. It's wildly divergent. In part two, we will hear a possible explanation of why that page seems to have had a different history than the others. Additional radiocarbon dating was done in 2018 with samples taken from two parchments and two paper leaves in the manuscript, as well as the left half of the map. The results indicate that the material they were written on dates from approximately 1400 to 1460, which agrees with carbon dating results of the Vinland map that were done in 2002. A date for the paper text is also indicated by a watermark, which can be traced to a paper mill known to be operating in Basel in the 1440s. The date and location corroborate the theory that the manuscripts were written during the Council of Basel, 
which occurred in that time period. The manuscript of the Historia Tartarorum, known as the Tartar Relation, was written at the same time as the Speculum Historiale and likely by the same scribe. The Tartar Relation is a famous account of a journey into the land of Genghis Khan in the mid 1200s. Until recently, Yale's copy was considered the only known copy of this text and was acquired in its current form, this slim, modern bound volume. In a 14th century copy of the Speculum Historiale, found in a library in Lucerne, Switzerland, which you can see on the left, it was discovered to have a copy of the Tartar Relation bound into the last volume, bringing the known existing copies of the Tartar Relation to two. This shows that there is at least one historical precedent for having these two texts bound together. Fire diagram of a Tartar relation shows where the Vinland map was found at the front of the text. This drawing was in a letter from Yale Jane Greenfield to researcher Jackie Olin at the Library of Congress in 1983. Researcher John Paul Floyd, author of Athari Saga, discovered information from an 1890s Colombian exhibition catalog in Madrid, which included a detailed description written by Father Pastor Perez of a 15th century manuscript. The manuscript, which belonged to the Cathedral Library of Zaragoza, was described as containing both Bovet's Speculum Historiale and the copy of de Bridia's Historia Tartarorum, bound together in one volume. No map was mentioned in the description. We now know that the Speculum Historiale and the Tartar Relation were originally purchased by Lawrence Witten in 1957 from bookseller Enzo Ferraioli of Barcelona in Spain. We also know that Ferraioli was one of four persons convicted of the theft of a collection of rare manuscripts from the Cathedral Library of Zaragoza in the 40s and 50s. These facts taken together make it fairly certain that the manuscript from the Cathedral Library described by Father Perez in the 1890s, is the same copy that Yale now owns. Apparently, since that time, that one manuscript first became two and now has become three manuscripts. The Vinland map itself is entirely underwhelming in most people's opinion. It has a shiny bleached appearance quite different visually from the other parchments present in the manuscript. There are wormholes in the map. They're packed with jaunty squares on the verso. Seen in raking light, the Vinland map shows us it's had a hard life. In transmitted light, the patches and the strip joining the two halves of the map are more easily seen. One of the patches covers a flaw in the parchment rather than a wormhole, and an area of abrasion is visible at the left of the map. Wormholes that correspond between the map and the speculum text were discovered decades ago and have been cited as the definitive proof that the Vinland map is an authentic 15th century work. This animation shows their location on the map itself. This animation shows the correspondence of the holes in the map on the right to hold in the first folio of the Speculum Historiale on the left. As you can see, the mapping wormhole placement does indicate that the parchment on which the Vinland map was drawn had to have originally been at the beginning of the text of the Speculum Historiale. To return to the choir diagram, it may be worth noting that the collation of the speculum on the right shows a missing parchment leaf, the dotted line, at the beginning of the first choir, and a stub, which may indicate that at least one other leaf was removed it would be tempting to conclude that this is where the parchment used for making the map was taken from. But Pep 
peptide mass fingerprinting has shown us that the outer folio and its missing half are made of goat skin, whereas the Vinland map has been shown to be made from cat skin. However, the matching wormholes indicate that there was originally another full folio, probably blank and leaves, at the beginning of the speculum text. This was a likely source of parchment used to make the Vinland map. The writing and the inks on the Vinland map are unusual. It's helpful for us to compare it with its companions. The script of the Speculum Historiale on the left, the Tartar Relation on the right, which were likely written by the same scribe, shows similarities in their style and their inks. The writing is Gothic in style and has the appearance of typical Iron Gall ink. The writing on the Vinland map in the center just doesn't look the same. The letters and lines have a faded quality, or perhaps a braided. A Vinland letter is shown here on the left for comparison to an area of the speculum text with some abraded and some scraped writing on the right. An extensive series of multispectral imaging was done on each of the manuscripts to help learn more about these objects and perhaps determine what the ink components are. In these images, the inks of the two manuscripts behave somewhat differently than the ink used on the Vinland map, although the differences are not substantial. Note that the speculum samples in the center are on paper, while the tartar, the bottom row, and of course the Vinland map on the top are on parchment. The extra light application of ink on the Vinland map may be one of the reasons for the inconclusive results. What was certain is that more analysis of the materials used to make the Vinland map is necessary. I'd like to summarize part one of our newest findings. New radiocarbon dating of all objects agrees. All substrates were made in the 15th century. The heat marks and the first leaves of the speculum do not match the hardware on the board. From this, we can conclude that the boards are not original to the text. They can no longer be used to prove the date of the manuscript. Both calf and goat skins were used to make the manuscript, making geographical origin more difficult to determine. DNA testing shows that both halves of the Vinland map are from the same animal and likely the same seed of parchment. Both halves of the Vinland map share a similar, a similar microbiome, as do the leaves of the Tartar Relation and the Speculum Historiale, except for the first leaf of the Tartar Relation, which is divergent and may indicate a different handling history. Multispectral imaging gives inconclusive results, but points to the need for more research. Dr. Richard Hark from Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage We'll discuss the further array of analyses performed on these manuscripts and their results in part two of our series. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Paul. Uh, the plot thickens. Um, for those of you that are, are continuing on to our, our third uh, and final speaker, um, some of these questions will be, will be answered, which is uh, wonderfully satisfying. Um, Dr. Richard Hark is a conservation scientist at the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. After earning degrees in chemistry, Dr. Harp served as a chemistry professor for 25 years before moving to Yale in 2017 to focus all his efforts on the scientific analysis of cultural heritage objects. He has worked on diverse projects involving the Vinland map and its sister manuscripts, 16th to 18th century British portraiture, the Gutenberg Bible and related incunables, 15th century karaoke cards, and early America mahogany furniture, and William Henry Fox Talbot's The Pencil of Nature. Uh, Dr. Hart. Welcome to part two of the ongoing story of the Vinland map and related manuscripts, new analyses, new evidence. I'm Richard Hark, and I am one of the conservation scientists at Yale's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Given how much has been published about the scientific analysis of the Vinland map, what does Yale have to add to the story of the object that was at one time considered the most valuable map in the world? With unprecedented access to the Vinland map and two other associated manuscripts, the Speculum Historiale and the Tartar Relation, 
and the availability of tools that previous investigators did not have, we hope to find additional information that would shed more light on this much debated object. Does any of the new evidence overturn the generally held belief that the map was drawn on genuine 15th century parchment using ink with a 20th century component? Let's let the data speak for itself. Before we dive into the details of the analysis, it is important to understand the limitations of scientific examination of cultural heritage objects. We cannot prove something is genuine using the analytical tools. However, we can show if the materials and techniques used to create a manuscript, a painting, or a map are in line with the materials and techniques available for the time and place the artifact was supposedly made. Multiple groups have examined the Vinland map for over 50 years, but our work represents the first extensive analysis done by Yale personnel and benefits from recent advances in instrumentation. X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, or XRF, is a technique that identifies many of the elements present in an object. The capability to make measurements at a single point has been available for decades, but it is only relatively recently that macro XRF allows large, flat objects to be conveniently scanned. The two-dimensional elemental maps that are generated allow one to visualize the distribution of elements in an area of interest. This approach does not require a sample to be taken and is therefore considered a highly useful non-destructive technique. Two of our colleagues are pictured here positioning the Vinland map for scanning. In this slide, we can see a mosaic image of the Vinland map in the top left corner, along with three false color elemental maps generated by macro X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. In these images, areas that are brighter in color indicate increased levels of an element, while the darker or black areas indicate a lower concentration or the absence of that element. In the elemental map of iron, we can see bright red areas on the left-hand side of the map near an abraded portion of the parchment, along the vertical fold at the center of the map where there is a paper repair, and in multiple small square areas corresponding to repairs of wormholes and blemishes in the parchment. The majority of European medieval manuscripts were made using iron gall ink, which is made from iron sulfate, known as green vitriol, powdered gall nuts, and a binder such as gum arabic. If the map had been drawn with iron gall ink, we should have been able to see the delineation of the map against a darker background in both the iron and the sulfur images, and perhaps in the copper map, if the vitriol used contained copper sulfate impurities. We are uncertain as to the source of the iron in certain areas, but it obviously does not correspond to the text or map outline. Previous studies of the Vinland map involving analysis of over 100 individual points suggested that titanium was present in the ink lines and not generally on the parchment. Our recent macro XRF analysis confirms the uneven presence of titanium in the ink used to draw the map and write its text and allows for the first time visualization of the distribution of titanium over the entirety of the map. The titanium elemental map you see here represents the accumulation of over 1.5 million individual spectra and clearly shows the areas where this element is present and where it is absent. The highlighted area is labeled Vinlanda Insula, the portion of the map meant to correspond to the northeastern part of the North American coastline. A macro XRF scan of this part of the map shows the high level of titanium as well as lesser amounts of barium. The presence of barium is significant because the earliest commercially produced titanium white pigments contain both titanium dioxide and barium sulfate. X-ray diffraction analysis of a 1923 sample of titanium dioxide manufactured in Norway confirmed the presence of barium sulfate in this material. Potassium, which may be associated with the ink's binder, appears in very diffuse lines along the coast of Vinland. The iron map of the same area shows that iron is somewhat randomly scattered on the parchment and clearly not along the map lines or the portion of an inscription that is visible in the upper right of the image. As mentioned in part one, multispectral imaging can be used to visualize the spectral response of ink to different wavelengths of light. When this approach was used to examine the Tartar relation, we discovered an altered passage of text on the first page of the manuscript. 
The highlighted section of text does not appear unusual as visible in ultraviolet illumination, but under infrared light, small sections of text appear to be different from the surrounding letters or words. The ink used to write this text is darker but responds similarly to ink used in the Vinland map. Its behavior is consistent with a carbon-containing ink, and the presence of carbon was later confirmed using Raman spectroscopy. In these elemental maps of the area of folio 3 of the Tartar relation that encompasses the altered passage, we can clearly see that the ink used to write the rest of the manuscript contains iron, sulfur, and copper, markers of a typical iron gall ink with copper impurities. The somewhat confusing appearance of the iron and copper maps is due to the fact that the XRF technique picks up the writing on the recto and verso of the page. This effect is not as evident in the sulfur map because sulfur, a lighter element, emits lower energy x-rays than the heavier iron and copper. Notice in the sulfur map two areas in the fourth and fifth lines of the text where there are gaps. These spaces correspond to areas of the text that were altered and rewritten with a different kind of ink. Our decision to scan this particular area of the page was guided by multispectral imaging done in the early stages of the Vinland map project. This page of the Tartar relation with the altered text corresponds to the same folio whose microbiome was so radically different from the profiles of the other pages that were sampled in the Tartar relation, the Speculum Historiale, and the Vinland map itself. This suggests that something occurred to the recto of folio 3 at some point in its history to alter the microbiome. To further explore this discovery, we utilized an RTAX instrument to obtain high-resolution XRF images of portions of this passage. The element maps show that the ink used to write the altered passage has the same constituents as the Vinland map ink, as evidenced by the presence of titanium and barium. The recto and verso images for a portion of the text are shown. The iron and copper maps correspond to the iron gall ink writing on the verso of the page. The potassium and sulfur maps are less clear because those elements seem to be associated not only with the new titanium containing ink, but possibly with the residue of other letters that once occupied the space on the recto of the page. Another important discovery we made with the use of macro XRF scanning is that the inscription on the verso of the map includes two types of ink. The passage in Latin on the right, which translates as second part of the third part of the speculum, was written with an iron gall ink, as the iron, copper, and sulfur maps demonstrate. This passage could refer to a bookbinder's note about how to assemble the Speculum Historiale, which is a massive work made up of 32 books or sections usually bound in four volumes. A second titanium containing ink was used to overwrite the original passage and add additional words. This new text, which roughly translates in tortured prose as drawing first part, second part of the third part of the Speculum, could be viewed as an attempt to connect the map with the Speculum Historiale, a document whose medieval origin is unquestioned. An iron gall ink inscription at the end of the volume indicates that the last page corresponds to the end of the third part of the Speculum. Yale's copy consists of books 21 to 24, which is indeed the second half of the third volume of the Speculum. It has been previously claimed that the presence of relatively high levels of titanium on the Vinland map is not only highly unusual, but totally unprecedented. To further explore this issue, we analyzed 120 ink-containing locations on 50 manuscript fragments produced in Central Europe in the 15th century, during the approximate time when the Vinland map was supposedly made. XRF point analysis using a five-minute measurement time was used to ensure better spectral resolution. We also looked at 34 ink areas on the Vinland map using the same analysis parameters. These two histograms show the relative signal intensity for iron and titanium plotted against the number of locations with that level of those elements. You can see that the ink of the Vinland map has very low iron levels compared to the 15th century manuscript fragments, just as the fragments contain much lower levels of titanium than the map. An expansion of these plots reveals how different the Vinland map ink is compared to typical medieval iron gall inks. Note that the purple areas represent the overlap of red and blue bars. 
We do not intend to suggest that a sampling of only 50 manuscripts is statistically representative of the entirety of 15th century manuscript production, but it does put the relative levels of these two elements in perspective. Perhaps even more interesting is the comparison of the levels of iron and titanium in the ink and parchment areas of the Vinland map. These histograms show that the amount of iron on the map is about the same in the parchment and the ink locations, while the titanium level is substantially higher in the ink. These results are simply a semi-quantitative way to represent what was shown in the macro XRF titanium and iron element maps. Macro XRF can tell us that titanium is present on the map, but it cannot identify the specific titanium-containing component of the ink. Raman microscopy, a form of molecular spectroscopy, can tell us what compounds are present in the ink. In a previous study, Raman spectra were acquired at nine points on the Vinland map, and the titanium species was identified as anatase, one of three natural forms of titanium dioxide. Raman spectroscopy also found that the dark ink component was simply carbon. Like macro XRF, the Raman microscope can be used to obtain maps showing distribution of materials. For example, a Raman map of a small Greek isle that included over 2,000 spectra was acquired. The heat map you see here, obtained with the Raman microscope, clearly shows for the first time how the anatase correlates with the black and yellow portions of the ink line as the animation transitions from the Raman map image to the visible image. Similar Raman maps and multiple point measurements were obtained to confirm that anatase is broadly distributed in the ink on the Vinland map. No evidence was seen of rutile or brookite, the other naturally occurring titanium dioxide polymorphs. Various processes have been used for commercial production of titanium dioxide, with a product containing anatase being available beginning in the 1920s, followed by manufacture of a rutile form in the late 1930s. The evidence just presented reinforces what previous researchers had found and firmly establishes that the ink on the recto and verso of the map, as well as a single location on the tartar relation, contains titanium and that this is in the form of anatase. But what does it tell us about when the ink was applied to the parchment and whether it is consistent with a medieval origin? Could the anatase be from a natural source? Is the ink merely unique rather than suspect? In order to explore this question, we turn to Field Emission Scanning Electron Microscopy, or FESEM. This required that tiny samples be removed from the manuscripts. Shown here are the sampling locations from the altered text area of Folio 3 of the Tartar Relation. The following slide shows the results obtained for an ink sample that contains titanium and carbon. In the scanning electron micrograph of an ink sample in the upper left, the bright particles correspond to elements with higher atomic mass. Using energy dispersive spectroscopy, or EDS, a technique similar to XRF, false color maps were generated that show the distribution of several elements, including titanium. Focusing in on the titanium rich area allows one to visualize the surface of the ink. At a magnification of 25,000, the shape and size of the anatase particles are visible. For comparison, a FESEM image at a magnification of 50,000 of the commercially available titanium dioxide manufactured in Norway in 1923 that was referenced earlier is shown here. The classic rhomboid shape and submicron size of the anatase particles first mentioned in connection with Walter Macron's analysis of the Vinland map, are clearly identified. This graphic shows where samples were obtained on the recto of the Vinland map. Note that we took scrapings of the parchment as well as part of an ongoing effort to confirm the identity of the coding that has been reported by several groups. 
to correlate with the macro XRF analysis presented earlier, this sample from the titanium-rich southern coast of Vinland was also imaged. This low magnification image shows the bright particles like those seen in the tartar relation sample. The upper left image shows a literal field of titanium with several larger particles of barite or barium sulfate scattered about. A side-by-side -side comparison at the same magnification, though with different spatial scales, of anatase from the 1923 commercial material and the Vinland map sample illustrates the striking similarity of the particles. The rhomboid shape of manufactured titanium dioxide is visible in both photomicrographs, suggesting the anatase in the Vinland map is of modern origin. White pigments containing titanium dioxide were only available commercially starting around 1920. Since the Vinland map first surfaces in 1957, our evidence supports the assertion that other investigators have made that it was produced at some point between the 1920s and the mid-1950s. The presence of barium sulfate mixed with anatase suggests the use of an earlier form of commercially available titanium white. It has been hypothesized that the titanium on the map is attributable to the presence of anatase in naturally occurring titanium-rich clays, but we did not find evidence of the aluminosilicates that would be associated with a clay source. Likewise, the naturally occurring mineral form of anatase is relatively rare, and there is no evidence of its use as a pigment. Finally, taken in conjunction with the macro XRF scan shown earlier, we present additional evidence that speaks to the question of whether the Vinland map is an innocent 20th century creation that was later ascribed to a 15th century source, or an intentional attempt to deceive. Four locations were sampled on the verso of the map. Time only permits us to look at one titanium-rich area. This FESEM image is oriented so that we are looking at the edge of the ink layer with some attached parchment fragments. The titanium particles are highlighted in the EDS map and are shown at higher magnification in the next image. The circled areas contain particles with the same rhomboid shape seen on the recto of the map and the altered text passage on the tartar relation. These particles are clearly embedded in the ink and not merely clinging to the surface. As Paula mentioned, John Paul Floyd provides historical evidence that strongly suggests the parchment of the Vinland map had previously been an end sheet in the Speculum Historiale. The matching wormholes were made when the speculum was intact. The individual who overwrote what could plausibly be a bookbinder's note on that former end sheet was apparently trying to establish a connection between the newly drawn Mappa Mundi and the well-known medieval volume of history. We have made several new exciting discoveries about the Vinland map, as well as the Tartar relation and Speculum Historiale, with which the map must be studied to understand the full story of these objects. Our data builds on and extends the careful analytical work done by multiple scientists over the past half century. While the Vinland map may no longer hold the distinction of being the world's most valuable map in monetary terms, it is certainly in contention for the distinction of being the most studied and most debated map in the world. It is our hope that our efforts have contributed productively to that conversation. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, it was wonderful to see the, the way the three presentations dovetailed each other um, and the way in which they uh, reinforced uh, each other's conclusions. To conduct the question and answer session, I encourage you to uh, write in your, your questions um, into, the, into the chat feature um, or the Q&A feature. Uh, and those will be moderated by Kristen Herdman. And I wanted to briefly introduce Kristen. Uh, Kristen is an advanced graduate student in the Medieval Studies program at Yale University. And she is the co-curator of the exhibit, The World of Maps. Um, and as you're thinking about uh, maps, and I'd, I'd like to encourage you to come to the exhibit currently at the Beinecke Library, uh, in which the Yale Center's um, scientific analysis is summarized. 
um, and the maps, including the Forma Leone uh, facsimile, um, are able to be viewed at the same time. So if you'd like to come and make your own analysis, please feel free to do so. Kristen? Thank you, and thank you for everyone for attending and to our wonderful speakers. Um, our first question is from Hugh McCullough, and it is for John Paul Floyd. Um, and uh, Mr. McCullough says, uh, the uh, map at present is very faint, apparently after a vigorous cleaning to remove staining that would have obscured any ink on the parchment. Is it possible that the Vinland map was present at the time of the ex exposition, but just not noticed as worthy of attention? Well, personally, personally, I do not put any weight, well, I put some weight, but not conclusive weight on the fact that it wasn't noticed. It wasn't mentioned in the catalog. I think more weight has to be put on the fact that uh, Perth Pastor, sorry, can you hear me? Are you all able to hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do put uh, more weight in the fact that Perez, Perez Pastor obviously saw the front cover um, of the, the the actual parchment um, leaf that had the Vinland map, that would have had the Vinland map on the other side had it been there at the time, and he didn't notice it in his description. And really, I, I, I think it's pushing it to, to say that it was there and they just didn't see it. But the, the thing that really strikes me is the fact that there is clear evidence now from the scientific um, side as well as the, um, the observational side that the inscription on the back has been tampered with um, by the same person in the same ink, at least, um, as the person who drew the map. So I think that that is prima facie evidence of forgery just by looking at the inscription. And I think that is very, very damaging in itself, quite aside from the, the other, the Formalione side, I really think the fact that somebody has put in the word delineation to try to link it, um, it just doesn't look good. With the idea about that, um, that changed the, the manuscript in mind, we have a question from an anonymous attendee um, that asks about what kind of ideas uh, do you guys have about why some emendations were made on the first page of the Tartar Relation in modern ink? I, uh, um, yeah, I actually looked into that and it does, um, I, to be honest, I, I don't have the, the information with me at the moment, but basically it's the, the, the change does make sense in that it seems to um, imply that the person who wrote the Tartar relation had personally, um, I think it's a, a change from to, to VD, you know, obviously uh, first person in Latin, meaning I saw this um, or we saw this. To be honest, I haven't looked at it, but I know that when I did look at it, it did make uh, sense in the sense that it was a change which seemed to, to shift the what the, the Tartar relation actually says to what would make sense in somebody um, trying to make the link between the Tartar relation and the person who had drawn the map in, as having personally personal knowledge of what they'd been told. I appreciate that I should really have had the information in front of me, but um, I'm happy to I don't know, leave, a, leave a, an annotation somewhere once I've looked into it again, because I, I definitely know that I, I did look into it and it did make sense to me at the time, even though I can't remember that much about it at the moment. If I could, if I could follow up uh, on, on John Floyd's, I have a John Paul's comment. I, I had a very different understanding of that. I've, I've looked at that uh, in some time with uh, Richard and Paula. Um, and what, what I think is happening there is the, the text that's been scraped away it's essentially just been replaced by the annotates containing ink. And I think what, what the forger was doing was practicing. I think they were trying to make sure that the inks in fact matched and looked correct. And what's interesting about uh, that, that the scanning of that page was it was fortuitous. It wasn't like we were looking for annotates on that page. We absolutely were not. Um, but when the analysis indicated that something was up, we, we looked more carefully at that, at that passage. Um, 
so I, unlike John Paul, I didn't see a, a significant change. Um, I, I think what's happening there is they are making sure that their inks match. And so whoever wrote the Tartar relation, they're trying to convince them that they also wrote um, the, uh, the Vinland map. So that's, I mean, that's fine. We both yeah. disagree on that, but it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of time for people to look into that. The other question there about the Delazio, the Delazio, uh, Paul Sanger wrote an excellent article um, when he's looking at, at the Vinland map and paleography and trying to figure out what was going on there. And that language is not, it doesn't make any sense. Whatever the forger did there is just bizarre. It doesn't actually tell us anything. So, um, whether whether their Latin was bad or they were just intending to, to mislead us, something else is going on with that additional text that says right before the second part of the sec, of the third part of the speculum. Um, but the other thing that I that I that I was concerned about with the uh, Tartar relation was the um, the biome, um, which indicated that this page had seen very different treatment. Uh, than the other pages in the manuscript. And so once again, um, I thought that indicated that they might have been, you know, people working on this, scraping away at it, treating it very differently than they had the other pages of the Tartar relation. But Richard and Paula, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I just want to add that when, um, because it happened to be the, the first folio of the Tartar relation when we found this unusual ink, we did look at all the rest of the pages in case anyone is wondering. Okay. And um, we didn't find any others. Uh, we actually looked at, at the pages from the speculum as well to see if that somehow would happen to that volume. And we did not see any evidence of a titanium containing ink, or rather I should say a carbon containing ink that would have shown up using the infrared uh, imaging uh, approach. Um, so uh, I, I like the idea of the, the forger practicing, but um, I think as with so many of these things, we can speculate but there's no way to be certain about intent and uh, the exact motivation at the time. But we do have, I think, very strong evidence to, to connect the Tartar Relation ink or the, the change in the Tartar Relation ink with the, the, both the front and the back of the, the map. And I think that's a, that's a, a rather compelling connection. Great. Well, could I, could, could I, I just... Oh. Of course. There's something, yeah, so it's just something that occurred to me um, when I did look into it, actually George D. Painter, who in the, the 1965 uh, Yale publication, the Vinland Map book, he dealt with the Tartar relation. He basically edited the, the, the translation. Um, and he noted specifically with regard to that passage, the, the VD passage um, that's been changed, he noted that it had been changed, well, it, that it didn't make grammatical sense as it stood. And that's quite interesting because he he spotted that there was something wrong with it, but he didn't, obviously he didn't realize that half, part of it was um, changed in a different tank. But I, I found it interesting that he spotted the fact that the change makes the passage ungrammatical. Um, just something to add. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Um, and this one is from Ray Lurie, and he asks if the manuscript was stolen from Zaragoza Cathedral Library, are there plans to return it? So Yale takes seriously um, all of the sort of um, problems with uh, provenance uh, with our collection. And so um, the Zaragoza connection has been known for, uh, for some time. And these are things that Yale is currently in conversation, uh, both with other libraries uh, and with Saragossa about. Um, so the, the, we didn't have enough time to get into uh, what John Paul started to talk about, which is um, the way in which these manuscripts were, were stolen from Spain. And unfortunately, the individual that stole them uh, died uh, before he was successfully prosecuted. And so um, there have been questions about the status of those manuscripts. But that is something that Yale does take very seriously. And, um, we will repatriate a manuscript that Saragossa asks us to. I have uh, another question for Ray, one that I feel like we get every time we talk about the Vinland map. What sum did Mellon or Yale pay for the map, and what is it valued at now? 
So um, we don't know what Mellon paid for the map. Um, the previous curator to me uh, said that at least in Yale's records, he wasn't able to find it. I certainly wasn't able to find it in our records. And that's, that isn't, the, it's not unusual that Yale wouldn't have that because as a gift, we wouldn't have required to know the, the amount that he paid for, uh, for it itself. Um, the Wikipedia page estimates that it was around 800,000. Um, I have no idea if that's correct or not, but I wish we had uh, more information about that. Um, at present, the manuscript doesn't contain, it, it, it is no longer uh, insured for millions because uh, it is a forgery. It does still have value as Richard suggested um, at the end of his presentation because uh, one, it has a history within New Haven and within Yale. Um, and that makes it very interesting. And it also has a history uh, in the more recent history of cartography. Um, but though that value is probably in the tens of thousands rather than in the millions. Just to come in, yeah, yes. if I could just come in on the, the amount paid by Mellon, um, because I, I noticed, and I know that another, um, a very insightful researcher, David Bradbury, in one of his videos, I noticed that he, he mentioned it as well, the Sunday Times, um, did mention a figure, and I don't want to quote it off the top of my head, but I know that if uh, if you watch one of uh, David's videos or if the, it's somewhere in the, in the back of my book in one of the notes, um, the Sunday Times did mention a figure of how much Mellon paid, whether it was accurate or not, who can say? We, we do know if it's, a, if it's of interest what uh, Witten paid for the manuscript, um, which was $3,500. Um, and I, I think that that's a fairly interesting uh, valuation, and at least that's what he tells us. On the other hand, Witten had four or five different answers for almost everything that he reported about the manuscript. So um, that's the only price that, that I've come up with that isn't the sort of primary source. Um, everything else, as, as even John, John Paul indicated, comes from other sources. They don't come directly from Mellon, and they don't come from a relationship with Yale that I'm aware of. Thank you. Well <laughs> I have a uh, question for the group from an anonymous attendee. Um, does the modern binding of the map and the Tartar relation give any clues about the date of the ink? Well, the modern binding um, that the Tartar relation uh, came to Yale in is uh, I think the, uh, the the conservator at Yale at the time, Jane Greenfield, pegged it as a fairly contemporary Spanish binding um, because of the color of the leather and the type of tooling. And um, I guess what that could indicate is that the map had already been forged at that point because it was then bound into this fairly modern 40s or 50s um, leather binding. I, yeah, I think it's, it, it, it is nondescript. Um, but yeah, that would, it means that it would have to have been done before the binding was put on it. That's about it. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think there's also the, the thing about the, the headbands um, which apparently there's, there's modern plastic, or at least post-war plastic in the, the, yeah, is that right? Yeah, there's monofilament, plastic thread, basically. And uh, although I now I can't recall the, if there's any date there, it was, um, the end leaves are reused and there is faint writing on, oh. or not writing, I think offset on the end leaves that I believe is in Spanish as well, but I don't I don't think there's a date on them. I, ha I have to say yes, with regard to the, the, the this is different from the um, the offset on the, the speculum, which dates from the Council of Basel, basically. Right. There is there is faint writing on the other one, and I <laughs> actually I was able to decipher it. Um, and it, it's from it's it's from some some Spanish work that has been published and republished time and time again. Um, again, it's in my book, I actually mentioned where it's from, but it's not really relevant to the map because it's sort of, apart from showing that the, the binding is Spanish, which people basically knew anyway, 
Um, so it's not really informative in that sense, but it's interesting to have that um, definitely confirmed what, what the actual work was. Francis uh, Guthman, I think, um, G-U-Z-M-A-N, um, but I'm sure people can buy my book if they want to find out the details. It's definitely, I, I definitely was able to, um, uh, to translate it so, uh, because there was a, an ultraviolet image. And again, David Bradbury um, showed the ultraviolet image in one of his videos. And basically the, the, the it was on the, the Yale, uh, one of the, the Binacle Libraries uh, web pages. And it was basically just a question of, you know, looking at a few words together, Googling the words and eventually coming up with the, the text, you know. We have one final question. Um, and this one, I think it's for Ray. Um, will there be a volume published, including the introduction of James Ackerman, um, the talk we've had today, and other lectures uh, that we've done around the exhibit? Uh, for example, the one by Professor Van Duzer. Um, well, we're flattered that you would, anyone out there would think that, uh, that that's possible and certainly uh, let us know if there's interest. Um, I, I think we also have several tea talks coming up that will be uh, of interest as well uh, on the portal. And so um, um, we're always excited to do that. And uh, I, I certainly would entertain uh, prospects, but at, at present, uh, there isn't anything planned to do at the moment. So if I can take that uh, as, as our final question, and I'm sorry to have ended with me, it's not that I like to do these things, but uh, I did want to thank um, the, our four participants. Uh, Kristen, uh, thank you so much for co-curating with me and for handling questions. Uh, John Paul, it was really uh, absolutely fascinating. And you were one of the earliest historians I saw that really had new information uh, to bring to bear. And I was really in, impressed that for both Richard and Paula that some of your, your uh, intuition was in fact proven uh, correct by the science. Uh, well, for Richard and Paula, it's been wonderful working with you for the past uh, few years on this project and uh, seeing it reach this conclusion. And could, could I just very quickly say, I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to say it during the, the presentation, but it's a very great privilege and I appreciate very much the fact that I've been asked to, to take part in this. And I think it's, I, I genuinely regard the scientific work that's been done as very worthwhile. Um, the, the chapter that I wrote in the book was actually published. I, I wrote it, I finished it before I realized that there was going to be more work done. Um, but I think it's been a model exercise and very worthwhile. Basically a case study on how you can apply modern techniques, scientific techniques to, to a classic, um, classic forgery. Yes, and the marrying of that sort of historic work that you were doing with the scientific work, because the historical work tells us where to look often uh, in these cases, or what are some of the false positives, what are some of the things that, that we shouldn't look for. And um, and Paula and Richard and the other uh, people um, at the Yale Scientific Community that worked on this were just um, dogged about it. And so anytime they found a lead, they, they followed that up. And, and honestly, uh, you know, there's always been questions about the science. Uh, from Macron's original analysis. Uh, and the nice thing is, is that they, they made sure that all of those questions had been answered as well. Um, so I thank you very much for your thoroughness and thank you for all of you out there that uh, stayed with us for this two hour uh, session. Um, I found it wonderfully productive. And if you haven't had a chance to come see the exhibit, uh, it's open until uh, January 8th. And I look forward to talking to you. Thank you.